I think one of the reasons why profitability does correlate with sustainability is because both are very much associated with visionary leaders, people that can think ahead uh, to the future of their company, also to do, do better in thinking ahead to the future of the planet. Hello and welcome to another Coffee with Mr. YT. Today my guest is Alex Wetzel from Rampbreak. You are their Chief Strategy Officer. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Alex? Thank you. Not too bad. Not too bad. As people can tell, we're both at home. Uh, we are right <laughs> I'm now. always at home. 15 years working from home. I'm uh, almost glad in terms of the evangelistic impact this is all going to have on people realizing, yes, you can work from home. Also, for you, this is nothing new. Nothing new. I can't imagine going to an office anymore. It really is. Like, I've been offered a few times. It's always been over my dead body. I, I, I love, used to be my two-foot commute. Now I have a bigger house. It's a 20-foot commute. So have things changed for you? I'm just curious. I know this is a little off topic about talking about the Internet of Things, but you now working with lots of us that aren't used to working from home. Have things changed, do you think, how we interact with each other in that sense? Um, well, I, I think people are still getting used to it. Uh, the main, the main issue is really, we actually, I think we see a lot more of the human side of, of people and that we get to see their kids running in the background or some distractions or some dogs or whatever. It, it, it actually really helps. I think it helps human contact. So I, I've, I've always really liked that side of like, Hey, somebody's kid, uh, is, is laughing in the background. People feel mortified usually uh but i actually like it because it humanizes them a little bit and then whenever you have a dispute or something like they can think like hey these people have kids too you know they're they're, they're human too and it's all it's always good to to kind of have that implicit connection which is a big reason why i've always thought it was a good thing so alex uh you work for rembrandt um actually i've worked with rembrandt many many moons ago when i was at activision um what do you do for them? Tell us a little bit about sure. your role and um, where sure. this is uh, all coming Yeah, from. Chief Strategy Officer is kind of a, a fancy way of saying uh, jack of all trades. Um, my background is in market research. Uh, I, I came in as, a, as an analyst. Uh, we were doing a lot of product planning on the future of technology and mobile video before there was mobile video. And uh, since then, I've been doing a lot of sourcing advisory uh, work. Uh, so working with large Fortune 500 uh, companies and IT intensive companies to optimize the way they they buy technology, which technologies they pick, how they negotiate contracts, uh, and uh, either buying new or helping them fix existing relationships. So sourcing advisory, I am part of the supply chain network organization. We spend a lot of time on sourcing, um, and in particular when it comes to technology. Um, where do you sort of like draw the line between strategic buying versus price buying? How, how do you reconcile all of that? Where do you go? Um, we, we actually have a scorecarding mechanism for, for that. So what we do is we go through and talk to everybody that touches the transaction. Um, and obviously there's the technical buyers, the sourcing organization, the uh, financial organization. What we're increasingly seeing and uh, some of it is, is also increasingly pushing uh, is getting sustainability and social responsibility teams involved in these uh, decisions because I think that's going to be the next uh, big sea change. And uh, each of these uh, stakeholders is assigned a weight uh, in, in the decision making. And each of them in turn assigns a weight to uh, the eight major categories that we have. Some are price, contract terms, scalability, um, financial stability of the supplier, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and from that, we get a, a profile of the culture that a company has, and that allows us to then adapt the, the solution to that culture. So if somebody's very price conscious, we balance more towards uh, the low cost suppliers and the uh, uh, more cost effective solutions. If somebody's more performance focused, we adapt to that. If somebody's focused on scalability, we move to that. So I think it, there's a continuum uh, and we've got a fairly good tool set for managing it as a continuum and not thinking of, of having the right solution or the best solution, uh, but the best fit, uh, because there, there is a good fit for everybody and it's not always the, the upper right quadrant. 
So I'm curious, you talk about um, social responsibility and you talk about sustainability. Uh, let me, I, I wanna get to sustainability in particular because I'm curious um, how you see that being affected by the cloud. But let me just make a, this a bigger question first. How has the cloud impacted what you do? Because I know your background was originally a lot of data center space spying and uh, data center running in general. How has the cloud shifted this? Um, what does Edge do to all of this? Uh, I, I'm curious what you see um, how, and what do you actually foresee? You know, being an analyst, you like to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the cloud um, has brought some very positive movements uh, among them price transparency in the market where a lot of our value uh, and frankly, a lot of the analyst and research value was, was just the lack of information. What do things cost in general? Um, you know, what are what are the right contract terms? Right now, they're they're much more visible and transparent. Uh, at a large enough scale, they're still negotiable and customizable. Um, but at the same time, for for the vast majority of customers, you're you're buying something that you see. On the other hand, there's the problem that the complexity of these buying models has gotten to such where everything can be transparent and laid out on a menu, uh, but people still wind up making incredibly bad decisions because they just don't take all the factors into consideration, uh, where you're not only paying for the service that you're using, let's say, but for the data transfer. And people wind up getting hit with massive surprise bills because of that. Uh, the decentralized control of buying has also created runaway spending. So there's optimization opportunities of a whole new type. So instead of negotiating a contract and negotiating rates with suppliers, uh, you wind up actually optimizing configurations and optimizing usage much more and removing waste. And whereas in traditional uh, data center environments, um, you know, that's probably accounted for you know, 20, 25% of the savings uh, that we generate in cloud-based environments, removing waste accounts for as much as 80% uh, of, of the savings that we generate because it's just so much easier to spin up capacity that you then wind up not using. It's interesting that you suggest that people spin up capacity they're not using. For me, the cloud was always the, the big thing is that I can scale capacity up and down. But I guess what you're talking about is people buying capacity and paying for it without scaling down. Right. And uh, I think part of this is that because it's so easy to scale up and down, there is less of a centralized planning process around mm -hmm. it. And there's a lot more of like an engineer gets access to this resource and he says, I'm going to build for my best case scenario for all the users in the company or all the user, all the consumers that we're dealing with to be using my service. And it turns out to be a niche service or a non-production service or something like that. In the meantime, he has this massive instance that's constantly running for something that might be accessed by only a few users or backburnered or and gone uh, from the picture altogether. Uh, there is also the underuse of the various pricing models and the, the various options that cloud providers offer, re reserved instances and spot instances and so on. Uh, so the, the, this is actually a whole cottage industry. I think unlike the data centers and CDNs where we're the only game in town, uh, there's a lot of people that are doing cloud optimizations using very complicated software tools for it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very well-known problem um, and I think a very interesting one in that it's less about technology and more about how democratizing access to technology within the corporation uh, actually creates its own waste problems that are in, in some ways uh, very different from those created by sort of the central planning and distribution of, of uh, the in-house uh, systems. So Let's take a step into IoT here. I'm curious, what do you see IoT, how has IoT influenced all of that? Uh, what do you see, and you know, IoT isn't new, but I think it had a significant impact on some of the buying around this. What are you seeing around this? Um, sure. What particular cases and so forth? Yeah, uh, I, I think IoT has really, um, obviously it's sustained demand uh, through a time when uh, a lot of resources have gotten cheaper and a lot of resources have, have gotten rationalized. Uh, it's a way to sustain revenues, even though uh, the unit costs of a lot of these services of bandwidth, of hosting, 
uh, they continue to drop. Um, so these companies need to make it up in volume and uh, having these new sources like IoT uh, is a great way to do it. Uh, but I think it's also created some very interesting challenges in that because the devices and the manufacturers, uh, especially for some of the older equipment out there, um, have not, let's just say, thought ahead about things like security. Um, the burden winds up falling on those backbones and uh, on those providers that are serving them uh, to essentially create secure connections to IoT devices because this was not native in uh, how they were built. So there, there is a certain amount of, of differentiation uh, if you will, that's built around uh, how do you compensate uh, for the gaps in the, and, and again, the, the decentralization and lack of control and lack of standards uh, in this, uh, and how do you create something that is a secure backbone against the backdrop of, uh, let's just say, less than secure edge. Edge. You just mentioned edge. <laughs> What's edge to you and what role do you play in that today? I personally, I feel the edge is gonna be the new data center, right? It's sort of like in the old, we had a data center and then we went through the cloud and now I, in some ways, the edge is the new, uh, um, if you wish, my own stuff. So what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I've been thinking about that for almost 20 years, uh, actually my first, independent report uh, as, uh, as a market analyst uh, a couple of years out of college was, um, I think, enterprise P2P uh, innovating at the internet periphery, back when people were trying to take Napster and make it into a business model. Uh, so I've, I've definitely got a long, uh, long history uh, on this. And, uh, you know, to some extent, I think um, there is a race um, between the efficiency of using all the compute resources and the um, cheapness of, of these resources. So in some ways, um, you know, there used to be an age of elegant coding uh, when people really used every byte of memory efficiently, every byte of storage efficiently, and really thought about, you know, how do you create something that, that is a masterpiece? Um, and then Bandwidth got cheap, storage got cheap, compute got cheap, and we did just fine with massive bloated crap <laughs> out there. So I think in some ways, um, this kind of efficient use of, uh, of bandwidth, efficient use of uh, compute power is good in the short term, but as the price of compute and the price of bandwidth drops to pretty much negligible and uh, approaches zero, then it, the other factors become much more important. Uh, and that's, again, the security uh, that comes into it, uh, the efficient allocation of resources, latency and performance. And uh, I think the, the best, some of the best uses of the edge actually wind up those that are contributing to the information uh, more so than the uh, computer bandwidth or other uh, sort of technical resources. For example, we're working with a startup that's doing segment routing, collecting latency information from every from thousands of computers all around the world uh, to find the best routes for the central backbone to use. Um, so essentially, they're cross-testing how the packets are randomly bouncing uh, to all these different users. And from that in real time, having, if you will, a GPS for future packets that shows here's congestion on these major links uh, that are going through here, uh, and that type of use of the edge to collect intelligence, to collect information, uh, is I think the most compelling uh, part. But that also obviously runs into various privacy concerns and and all of these uh, fun things that are uh, I think gripping the IoT world uh, in terms of you know when are you the consumer and when are you the product uh, of of this massive system. So we started out talking about the cloud from a sustainability and a social uh, responsibility point of view. Um, talk a little bit about this. How does someone assess both uh, sustainability and social impact? Number one, I guess my first question, and maybe this is too simple of a question, but has the cloud make, made us more sustainable? 
<sighs> well, that's uh, on, on the one hand, hyperscale computing is by its nature um, more energy efficient uh, in that just the, the PUEs, the, the percent of power that a data center wastes uh, is much better in an Amazon data center than you know, any bank's data center, uh, with the exception of you know potentially a few test facilities with really large companies like you know an eBay or an Intel. For the most part, these hyperscale facilities are, are incredibly power efficient. Uh, at the same time, as I said, they, they invite a new type of waste, and there are certainly a lot of differences between the providers and the companies in terms of uh, how conscious they are of this waste uh, over time. So. Uh, it's in general uh, a positive, uh, but again, very much tied into the psychology of the usage and how that translates uh, into uh, wasted resources. And one of our kind of side efforts is to capture wasted capacity both within the cloud and uh, within the traditional compute environments and really uh, try to reuse it as opposed to uh, just you know, having things run idle. Um, but in terms of the other dimensions of, of social responsibility, uh, whether that's human rights, um, whether that's transparency, uh, you know, I think there, there's a lot more that can be done uh, in, in the way that people are buying and the, the, the way that people are, are making decisions. I think consumers are much more conscious of, you know, is, is the coffee that I'm buying, uh, you know, free trade or fair trade, um, uh, you know, it, 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 what's the impact that it's making on the world? Uh, you know, people as consumers wouldn't buy conflict diamonds or whatever else. As corporate buyers, um, that's oftentimes not part of the process. So in the hundreds of sourcing deals that I've done, somebody actually bringing in a social responsibility or sustainability voice is very rare. And when they do, a lot of these quote unquote chief sustainability officers wind up reporting to the VP of marketing. Um, you know, it's, it's a PR function. It's, it's a reputation management function as opposed to reflecting an actual soul of the company. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is make it a much more integral part of the process and actually flesh out the ways in which having that better culture, uh, having an understanding of treating employees better, uh, treating the environment better, uh, being more transparent, not only within your organization, but in, across your entire supply chain, uh, will not only make you feel better as a human being, but actually make you a better company, um, better prepared to face future challenges, better prepared to adapt, uh, more responsive. And we're, we've done some research in terms of showing that uh, actually higher social responsibility scores do correlate uh, with higher profitability. The asterisk on that, it's, it's also correlated with slightly lower growth, um, but uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's a different conversation. <laughs> so I, I wanna, I have two questions to close. The first question is, um, um, you talked about uh, weighting and scorecards and sort of like giving each of those a percentage weight. What do you people typically, what do you see in terms of ranges for sustainability and social responsibility in terms of weight of 100%? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's historically it's been between three and 5%, uh, which is really not good. <laughs> you know, I think we're, one of our projects is really to trace um, that it, the reasons that it should have a higher impact. Um, not only the reputational ones, but as I said, more uh, kind of corporate process and organization ones uh, that uh, attract better people, uh, make your company more efficient, et cetera. Um, but we got to prove it. We got to demonstrate it. And the good thing is that the next generation of business leaders is very much aligned with that. And there's a lot of interest, a lot of research, uh, a lot more rating sources out there for social responsibility than there were even you know, two or three years ago. So three to five percent is sort of what you typically see, and who uh, said? Yeah, I mean, that's that's know, typical. Who sets that? It's sort of like if you'd ask me to do any sort of purchasing decision for Deloitte, I, I wouldn't know what to put against. I mean, I guess I have my own opinion, but who sets that in one of those? Um, yeah, so it's it's really it's about the incentive structure. 
uh, what it what it comes down to um, is that people have certain budgets and they have a big pain in, in trying to grow and exceed them. Uh, people have uh, certain performance targets and when the website goes down and it's unexplained, people get fired. You know, there, there's, there's very much a core job responsibility and incentive structure that's tied to price, performance, uh, contract terms, stability of your partners. Uh, there's a less clear defined incentive structure for being part of the corporate, uh, you know, uh, aligning with the corporate culture of responsibility because there, there's less of a language and there's less of a set of metrics. Uh, so by bringing in that set of metrics and saying, you know, our CSR hub score is this, our MSCI score is this, our rep risk score is this, and these are KPIs within our organization. People get bonused for increasing them. Uh, people get fired if we get blown out of the water for them. Uh, that's when those percentages go up. Uh, before that, it's really just a, a part of people's personal drive and being a visionary. I think one of the reasons why profitability does correlate with sustainability is because both are very much associated with visionary leaders, people that can think ahead uh, to the future of their company, also to do, do better in thinking ahead to the future of the planet. Uh, and that certainly helps them just say, hey, I'm... I'm a big poo vine. This is going to be my stamp uh, and this is going to be my impact on this company is that I'm going to, let's say, build a data center that's more sustainable. I'm going to pay a little bit more for somebody that treats their employees better. And at the end of the day, that's how I'm going to build a better team. I'm going to inspire them as a leader. Uh, and that's how I'm going to feel good about myself. Uh, and the company that gives the leaders this responsibility is the type that attracts these visionaries. Interesting. I really love how you talk about those aspects and how you're passionate about it. I, I want to close with one question and I pick up on a word you used, the soul. I think you used the company soul or something like this. Um, what's your soul in this all? Where, where, where does your soul fall and so forth? <laughs> well, my, my soul, and this is kind of a, going back to something that, that you mentioned a little while back is in that you know, I've had a lot of history in this. Uh, and one of the things I remember was from 10 years ago, uh, doing a speech at Harvard um, in a conference that was organized by Ray Kurzweil and, and co on transhumanism. Uh, and uh, really kind of thinking about the future of, hey, uh, the, it, immortality through your works is great, immortality through having kids is great, but I'd really like just immortality through not dying. <laughs> and one of the things that, uh, you know, these folks all run into is no matter what they think of uh, that glorious future of integration of man and machine, um, it's always a service of some sort. Uh, there's somebody that's freezing your brain. Uh, there's somebody that's uh, um, melding you with machine and backing up your consciousness somewhere. And always in all of these places, there is a service level. There is a contract in there that governs how that interaction happens. And although I'm not a lawyer, I spend a lot of my time figuring out what the contractual and the sort of governance mechanisms of these service relationships are. And as we bring um, sort of the, the, the melding of our usual day-to-day -day lives, the homes and the machines, and then the humans and the machines, uh, it's really interesting for us to watch how those agreements uh, get hashed out and negotiate, what rights we give uh, to Amazon to listen in uh, on our conversation and to Facebook to track our social media activities. Um, what rights do we have if we're disputing somebody that has backed up our consciousness and then double billed us? And they say, well, pay, pay, our, pay our bill again or we're deleting. It's like, okay, I'm going to pay. Uh, so I think my uh, real consciousness in all of this and my soul is finding out what the right relationships are, what the right power structures and the balance structures are so that services relationships can be a help rather than a jail to us uh, in terms of how we interact with, with our providers. And uh, that's that to me is the most fascinating aspect of all of this uh, is really when our lives are technology enabled, uh, what are the rules that govern it? I actually did not see that one coming, but they <laughs> it was fascinating. I, yeah. I have to say in my role of um, having to review contracts and so forth, I've always been very 
language has always been something interesting to me. Um, English isn't my first language. It's not my mother tongue. And so I always felt like, hmm, am I really good at looking at language? And what it comes back to, to me is something you talked about a little bit. It's sort of like, what's the spirit of the language? Absolutely. It ain't so much at the end, it matters what is written down. But I always wonder what's the spirit behind it? What's the intention behind it? And so, yeah. but uh, thank you for taking us there, Alex. I appreciate it. Nice meeting you. And uh, with that, we've come to another end of another coffee chat. Uh, one of those virtual ones. Do I have real coffee here? Um, yeah. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show and missed parts of it, uh, please check out our playlist on YouTube. Or if you want to watch any of the previous shows, we have a playlist. Just search for Coffee with Mr. IT and you get to see Alex and many other illuminaries of technology. So with that, thanks everyone. Goodbye. Shh.